All right. Well, our text this morning, I've actually read two of them, but I'd like to read the third one, which is the one that we're going to perhaps focus on primarily. That's Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. As I read this, let's remember that this is God's Word. This is the Word of Christ, even though the Apostle Paul has written it. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is true. And it was true not only for them, for the Ephesians, but it's true for us if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3, Paul writes this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. By the way, we're going to come back to that because we want to know what those things are, right? Because those are reasons to love the Lord as well. But then he says, uh, points out one in particular, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Now, we are going to want to just kind of take that apart because it's a lot to take in. <laughs> it just... You know, in those statements, they're all, they're all loaded. Every one of those phrases is just loaded with, um, with truth and reasons why we should love the Lord. Okay, but just backing up for a moment, not, not, a, you know, not a great deal, but remember that we've been focusing on God's love for us as a way of strengthening our love for Him. We know the Spirit of God works in us to you know, in, in not only to create this love, but also to strengthen it. But he works through the different means of grace. But the way he works is by revealing to us the loveliness of God and the glory of God and the grace of God and all these things that we're looking at, particularly his grace, to, to stir us up to, to love him in return. Now, so what we've seen so far is that he has shown us a great deal of love, first of all, in making us. That's, you know, we were praying about that, giving us existence, making us in his image, so that we might know him. Uh, let's not overlook that blessing. You know, it really, technically, theoretically, God could have made us an animal, but he made us human beings in his image. Now, he also takes care of us, again, as a father takes care of his children, you know, every good thing that we have received in this world is not just come to us accidentally. We're not just lucky that we're born here and we have all these things. This, these are things that God has given to us, that He has chosen to give to us, and we should be thankful for those. We should be thankful that He filled the world with so, much, so many good things, right? We looked at that. I mean, this, this world could have been some kind of volcanic world of, of just sulfur and brimstone, so to speak, and Life could have been miserable, but that's not the way God made it. Um, God has filled it with so many different things, so many different things to see and hear and taste and touch and smell. It's amazing. And not only did he fill the world with these things, but he also gave us the ability to enjoy them. Last week, we began to focus on those things that are even more important, that he showed his love for us in giving to us his son. And let's not forget the backdrop of that. He didn't give us his son while we were his friends, but while we were his enemies. Not while we were innocent, but while we were the debtors to his justice. Not while we were on our way to hell or even just to live forever, excuse me, on our way to heaven, but, and, or maybe even just to live forever in this world, but we were on our way to everlasting punishment in a very unpleasant place. See, so, God was offended by us. We were under his judgment, but while we were in that condition, God gave the only price that could have redeemed us, and that price was that which was most precious to him, and that is his son. And we know that his son came into the world to guarantee that we would be saved by obeying for us and, of course, by suffering God's judgment for our sins, 
for our sins on the cross. God is just, unlike the God of the, of the Muslims, the uh, Allah, who believes that crimes are basically just men committing offenses against one another and has nothing to do with him. Everything that we do is a crime against God if it is not according to his will. God can't just simply overlook sin and just arbitrarily forgive it. He needs a payment. And that was the only payment that he could accept. But he was willing to make that payment. Now, really, that is love beyond degree. That is infinite love. But, you know, again, there is still more, okay? There is more. Now, this morning, we're going to look at another way in which God has loved us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that is by singling us out to save us. Now, again, as I've already said, He offers salvation to all. We understand that at least to everyone who hears the gospel in those places that he has ordained that the gospel would reach. Jesus said that he came into the world that he would save all peoples. You know, when he be lifted up, he would draw all mankind to himself, all kinds of people. You know, not just the Jews, not just the physical offspring of Abraham, but also the Gentiles who are the rest of the world. You know, everyone is to, is to be called. Everyone is to be sought after and, and reached. That's why we do missions. But the Bible is also very clear that God does not save all. He only saves some. He only saves those that he has chosen in eternity. And we need to remember that what Jesus did would have done us no good at all if he had not chosen us. You know, even though we were born at a time and in a place where the gospel had reached, and, and that was God's mercy to us, even though we heard it from a parent or a friend or some other believer, if God had not chosen to show mercy on us, we never would have received the Lord Jesus Christ. We never would have been saved. John writes in 1 John 4.19, and sometimes I think we miss the point of this, he says, we love because he first loved us. And what he means is we love him, we love God, we love Christ, because God first loved us and sent his son, and we're going to see his spirit to quicken us to life, as we already read in Ephesians 2, because he set his affection on us in eternity. Now, Paul tells us first in our text that God made a choice. He made a choice as to whom he would save, as to whom he would show mercy. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us. By the way, this isn't the only place in Scripture where that choice is referred to. Paul also writes in 2 Thessalonians, this is just one other example. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. God chose us. Paul also writes in that very um, familiar verse in Romans 9, verses 23 through 24, where he talks about um, out of the mass of fallen humanity, how the Lord has set aside some to make vessels of honor and others to be vessels of wrath. Romans 9, 23 and 24. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. He chooses to make some vessels of mercy. He leaves others to be vessels of wrath. Now, again, this is a choice he made. It's not a choice we made, okay? We are the ones who trust in Jesus, not that God is trusting for us, but we would never be able to trust him if he had not first chosen us. And again, that's going to be clearer as we 
work our way through these texts. Now, Paul tells us, secondly, that God made this choice in eternity, in verse 4, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Okay, God did not make this choice in time. He didn't see us trusting in Jesus and say, well, I choose you because you chose me. We're going to see He doesn't even look forward to do that, but He made this choice in eternity, before the foundation of the world. This is before God created anything. You know, the word world here means the cosmos. It's not referring to just this planet. Sometimes we use the word world to refer to this world we live in, but the world is everything, okay? The cosmos, the whole creation. Before God made anything, before He made time, before He made space, if space is in fact a created thing, most people, you know, many Christians believe that's the case. Certainly before He made matter, we know matter is not eternal. In eternity when there was only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing as He knows all things, that we would fall in Adam, that we would all become His enemies, that we would all become guilty enough to suffer in hell forever, God was determined already to save some of us by sending His Son into the world. Now, that's just another way of referring to what we call the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, what we call that eternal agreement between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing these things were going to take place to work out our salvation, that the Son would be willingly come into the world, take our nature, meet the conditions of the covenant in order to save us. The Holy Spirit would come and apply Christ to us. The Father having chosen who it is He would save and He would give those people to Christ. Sometimes we think of that as sort of like a, you know, a, 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 I want to call it a powwow. <laughs> you know, the, the three persons of the Godhead sit down in eternity and they kind of work out what's going to happen. And I think that's the way we often think about it, isn't it? But it would be wrong to think of God doing this, thinking about, you know, what's going to happen, thinking about what He's going to do in response to this, and then, you know, picking out some people to save. The way we should understand this is that God knew from all eternity exactly what was going to happen. He knew from all eternity exactly what He was going to do. This is His eternal purpose from all eternity. It was a part of His eternal plan this is always what He intended to do, to allow this fall to take place and to save particular individuals, particular individuals, to save us. Okay? And that's what we need to think about. From all eternity, we are an eternal thought in the mind of God. God has eternally purposed not only to create us, but to save us from this fall into sin. Now, he chose to do this without anything that he would foresee us doing, okay? And that's a very important part. What Paul says of Jacob and Esau, again in Romans chapter 9, is equally true of us. Let me read in verses 11 through 13. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, not because of what they do, but because of him who calls, because of God. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now think about what Paul's saying here. Before Jacob and Esau were born, before they had done anything, God already loved Jacob, and by the way, Jacob was no better than Esau, ultimately. And so God loved Jacob in spite of his sin. And he hated Esau. God hated Esau. God hates people. Well, that's what the Bible says, right? He hates the wicked. Now, God is benevolent to the wicked. God is kind to evil and ungrateful men. But it doesn't mean that, you know, his benevolence doesn't mean he loves them. They're at war, Okay. So he hates Esau. Why? Because of his sin. And there again we see God's choice that he is expressing here. Um, and again, 
uh, apart from anything that either of these two do. Now, there are so many Christians today who believe that God makes his choice even in eternity based upon what he saw or foresaw that we would do. They think that that's what Paul is actually teaching in Romans 8 verse 29 where he says this, and we read this in our meditation, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. They think that what he foreknew is that we would come to Christ, that when we were presented with the gospel, we would receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and knowing that we would, he predestined us to salvation. In other words, his choice was based on our choice. But I want you to notice that Paul is not saying that there was something God foreknew that we would do, but that there were certain individuals that he foreknew. He foreknows them, not what they're doing. And this really has to do with God's foreloving us. And we're going to look at that in just a few more moments. Now, Paul couldn't have meant that God chose us because of what he would see us doing in the future. Because all he could have foreseen us doing in the future, apart from his grace, is rejecting the gospel every time it is offered to us. We do need to remember that apart from his grace, we are his enemies. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 10, while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. We need to remember that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive. We need to remember that when we are in that state, Paul tells us very clearly, being his enemies, we were his enemies because we refused to submit to him, and we refused to submit to God because we could not submit to God apart from his grace. Romans 8, verses 7 through 8. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. Why? For it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, those who are in the flesh are those who are in the state of nature as they come into the world, those who do not have the spirit or the grace that God gives that makes them alive. You see, if God doesn't give you grace, all we can do is hate him, and we can't do anything else. So what would God foresee us doing apart from his grace? But hating him. Jesus says in John 6, 63, the flesh, which is all we have coming into the world, profits nothing. And Jesus said in that state, uh, we cannot come to him. Remember what he says in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And that drawing is the work of his spirit. That's the grace that he gives, that he gives to his chosen. No one is able to come to Christ apart from the Father's empowering. We did not choose him. God could not foresee us choosing him. He would foresee us choosing against him. Again, think of your own experience. There was a time when you chose against him. That is what we do in a state of nature. He chose us. We have to see he's the only one who could make the choice because we would choose against him. He has to be the one who chooses us because we would never choose him. Paul tells us in our passage that he actually chose us so that we might become holy and blameless in Christ. Now, here's another point because, again, those who believe that God makes his choice based upon what he foresees us doing believes that, you know, they believe that God foresees us trusting in Jesus on our own strength. And in Jesus, we become holy and blameless. And so then God chooses us based on the fact that we're holy and blameless in Christ. But we need to, to notice that he chose us that we might become holy and blameless, not because we were holy and blameless. He writes in verse 4, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that 
we would be holy and blameless before Him, not because we would be holy and blameless. I hope you see the difference between those two things. So again, those who think it was our choice believe God foresaw that, that we would choose Christ and then He chose us. But Paul says, God chose us in Christ to make us holy. His choice is why we are in Christ and why in Christ we are acceptable to Him. Paul goes on to say that He chose to adopt us. Why did He make us holy and blameless? It's so that He might bring us into His family. Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 1, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. Remember that God's plan was not simply to save us from judgment. His plan was to bring us into His family and to make us His children. He tells us in Romans 8, verse 29, which we've already read, that He determined, predestined us to become like His Son so that His Son would be the firstborn among many who are like Him. Okay? He made us like Him so He could include us in the family. You know, Christ is, is the image we are to bear. He is the obedient Son of God. He is the one who pleases Him. And He puts us in Christ so that we can be His children as well. Now, if we've trusted Christ, we are His children. As John writes, beloved, now we are children of God. And then he goes on to say, it may not be obvious, but it will be obvious when Jesus returns. He says in 1 John 2, verse 1, it has not yet appeared, or excuse me, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And in the meantime, He says, we will try by His grace, and this is very important, to become as much like Jesus as possible. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. How do we know we're the children of God? It's because we're working towards becoming more and more like Jesus, purifying ourselves from the world, from our sins, to become more like Him. So He chose us. He chose us in eternity before He made anything. He chose us without anything in view as far as what we would do. He chose to make us holy and blameless in Christ so that He may adopt us as His children and now the question is, why did he do that? Paul says he did it purely because of his love, purely out of love. That's the reason. He didn't have to do it, except that his love compelled him. You know, there's a sense, uh, again, I'll quote um, an idea of Jonathan Edwards. He says there's a sense in which God's love would not allow him to let all mankind perish. He had to have mercy on some. His love compelled him to do that. And Paul talks about that in Ephesians 1. He says in verse 4 and 5, in love He predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. And you know, He says the same thing in Romans 8 verse 29 when He says, for those whom He foreknew, remember, He also predestined that foreknowledge is saying the same thing. In love, He predestined us. Those whom He foreknew, those whom He foreloved, He predestined. The Bible says that God loved certain individuals from all eternity. His heart was, was already going out to them. And because of that love that He centered upon them, He predestined them. And again, he, he did that for us, for trusting in Him this morning. And remember that God did not choose us because we were lovely. It wasn't our loveliness that overcame Him. He said, you know what, I really, I really, you know, as I look at you guys, I really love you guys, you know. I just got to save you. I'm not going to save these, but I'm going to save you guys because you're so beautiful. Now, remember what we look like, okay? We were all God's enemies. We all hated Him. We were all running away from Him. So He didn't choose us because we were lovely, but because He loved us, He chose to make us lovely in Christ so that He could love us, you see. 
That's the grace of God. Now, Paul tells us that the reason why he did this was out of love, but he gives us another reason here as well. He did it to put his grace on display, okay? To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And remember, the grace is where God gives something to someone when they deserve just the opposite. And that's exactly what he's doing here. That he would set his affection on us when we deserve everlasting punishment, that he would make us holy and blameless in Christ and in Christ make us his sons and his daughters, that glorifies, that magnifies, that draws attention. I think it's drawn our attention this morning to his infinite grace. So out of love, out of a desire to reveal that love, that's what grace is, is love, okay? God wanted to put his love on display, and this is how he chose to do it, and we are the recipients of that. We are the ones blessed by that. And then, having chosen us, as we saw in, our, in, our, in a couple of our texts, having chosen us purely out of his infinite love, in time, he called us. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans 8.30, and these whom he predestined, he also called Okay. Now, that is not really referring to the call of the gospel. It's not when we went to an evangelistic outreach. It's not necessarily when somebody brought the gospel to us, although we did need to hear it. But he's referring here to the inward call of God's Holy Spirit, that call that raises the dead, okay? That only those who were chosen actually ever hear. Remember what I read in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 6? We were dead in our sins, which means we hated God and we were his enemies, right? We were living like the rest of the world. We were indulging our lusts and sinning against God. We were the children of wrath, which means we were under his wrath. But then he says in verses 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, this is talking about the inward call of the Holy Spirit. We were dead, and he raised us to life by the Spirit of God working in us. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, the Spirit, where the wind blows where, it's, where it wills, you hear the sound of it, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, so it is It's everyone. with everyone that's born of the Spirit. The Spirit, you know, again, double entendre, he's talking about the Spirit, though he's talking about the wind, and he says the Spirit is like the wind. Even as the wind blows where it wills, the Spirit is sovereignly blowing, as it were, the breath of life into these dead bones, and he's making them alive. That's what he does sovereignly, and he does that, again, for those whom the Father has chosen See, Paul does not say we believed and then God raised us. We were dead. And being dead, and being in the flesh, we cannot please God. We can't, and certainly would please Him if we trusted Him. We were dead and God in His mercy made us alive and then we trusted in Him. He gave us the Spirit to give us faith, the faith that works by love. And then we trusted in Jesus and then we were saved. And then, of course, after the Spirit raised us and we believed, we trusted in Christ, then we were justified. Romans 8, verse 30, those whom he called, he also justified. And then, having been justified, he says, we will be glorified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Here's another reason to love God. His eternal choice of us brings us all the way to heaven. Remember what we just sang in our hymn, hymn 470? Not one of all the chosen race but shall to heaven attain. Just simply reflecting what Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 30. As I pointed out before on numerous occasions, there's no slippage, you know, between these different categories. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Paul picks up everyone in each of these categories and he moves them from category to category 
until they reach the end. Final glorification, no slippage. Paul also tells us that in a certain sense, we're already there. We're already glorified. I, I don't know if you think about this passage in Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6, but listen to what Paul says here. He says, when we are dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him. He made us alive. That's, again, the call of the Holy Spirit. But then he says, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice he uses the past tense. He, we, he not only raised us up with him, but he seated us with him. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. How can that be? We're still here. How can we be with Christ and here? Well, it's because two reasons. We are united with Christ who is seated in heaven. So in a certain sense, Christ as our representative is seated in heaven for us and we are absolutely certain that we're going to be seated there as well. And that's really the second reason. Christ is there as our surety and because he's there, we will certainly be there, okay? So it is so certain, Paul refers to it as past tense. Same thing in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, right? Those whom he justified, and we are justified by faith in Christ, he also glorified. Uh, we're, we're already glorified? Well, the already and the not yet. Already in Christ, but not yet as far as our experience. But so certain to take place, it can be referred to in the past tense. And then remember, let's not forget what makes this so special. What God has done for us, he has not done for everyone. He has not chosen everyone. We need to remember what Jesus says. The vast majority of mankind will not make it to heaven. Think about Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus says this, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. God has determined to leave the, the vast majority of mankind in their rebellious state to face the consequences of their sins. And again, we have to understand this in the biblical context. What, it's not saying that God is barring them from the kingdom. He's not keeping anyone from entering. He's not hardening anybody's hearts. He's just simply choosing not to intervene. He is passing over them in his mercy, um, leaving them to their rebellion and to their sin and the consequences of their sins because God is not really bound to show mercy to anyone, is he? That's something he can either choose to do or not choose to do because we're all guilty. We all deserve damnation. God can show us mercy because of Christ, but he can also choose not to show mercy. And that's exactly what we saw in Romans chapter 9 about vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and vessels of mercy that God has prepared beforehand for glory. The potter has the right over the clay, over the mass of fallen humanity to do with them what he wills. Most of them are going to be vessels of wrath. But if you love him this morning, he has not left you. He has not passed over you. He has made you a vessel of mercy. He chose you in eternity to give you the grace to enter through that narrow gate, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be saved. In light of that, how much should you, how much should I love him for that mercy, for that grace? Well, that's what we need to think about and meditate on. Um, and let that, again, let the consideration of that cause our affection, our love for the Lord to grow. Well, as we... Um, bow for a moment of prayer, and as we prepare to come to the table, let's remember all these things because this reminds us of, of what Jesus did to save sinners, and we need to combine that with the fact that this would have done us no good if God had not first chosen to set his affection on us or if he had not determined eternally to save us. God's eternal love is the only reason why we're safe, 
And we need to thank and praise and love the Lord for that. 